Welcome back to Hinduism. In this video, we're going to look at Vedanta, which is a type of Hindu philosophy. The word Vedanta means end of the Veda. So this is the end of the Hindu scriptures called the Veda. The earlier part of the Veda, the Samhita, consists of hymns, chants, mantras, and formulas that are used in Vedic rituals, especially the uh, fire sacrifices or yajnas. Vedanta is based on the Upanishads, the fourth and last part of Vedic scriptures. And these have more philosophical teachings in them about karma, samsara, or the cycle of rebirth, and salvation, or moksha. In addition to the Upanishads, other texts that are considered Vedanta include the Bhagavad Gita, which is the chapter of the epic Mahabharata, in which the god Krishna gives teachings on how to attain moksha, and a later text called the Brahma Sutras, which was written after the Upanishads, but basically contains a summary of the teachings of the Upanishads, kind of arranged more systematically. There are multiple schools of Vedanta. So Vedanta is not one philosophical system, but several different schools of thought that attempt to interpret the Upanishads and other Vedanta texts philosophically. The three main schools are Advaita or non-dual, Vishishtadvaita or qualified non-dual, and Dvaita or dual philosophy. The picture on the right shows a student and a teacher and these people are in the wilderness, they're seated on mats, and so this is a kind of setting, a traditional setting, in which Vedanta would be studied. Typically by people who are living as shramanas or renunciates, and oftentimes they would dwell in somewhat secluded settings. So the purpose of Vedanta is to basically renounce the world and attain union with Brahman or the Supreme Being. The three main schools of Vedanta are classified based on their ontology. An ontology is a theory of being. So it's a theory of the number and kind of beings that there are in the world. Ontology is a type of metaphysical theory. In philosophy, metaphysics refers to a theory of the basic or fundamental nature of reality. Most obviously, these include ontologies. They can also include, for example, theories of causation. There are three main types of ontology, dualism, monism, and pluralism. Dualism is the theory that there's two main types of beings or existences. Usually, these are mind and matter. Instead of the term matter, sometimes the word physical being or physical existence is preferred because according to the modern scientific view, matter is only one of the possible states of physical energy. For example, light energy or photons don't count as matter. But that's the most common type of dualism, distinguishing between physical reality and mind or consciousness when it's regarded as fundamentally not physical in its nature. Another common type of ontology is monism. This is the theory that there's only one fundamental type of being or existence. There are two main varieties of monism, materialism and idealism. Materialism, also called physicalism, is the theory that only matter or physical being is what fundamentally exists. So if materialists believe in consciousness, they believe consciousness is just a type or activity of physical being. Idealism is the theory that only mind or consciousness fundamentally exists. So um, materialism is by far more common than idealism historically. However, you do find idealism show up in many philosophical traditions. And in particular, Advaita Vedanta from Hinduism is often interpreted as a form of idealism because of its priority of the consciousness of the Supreme Being. Another type of monism is called extreme monism. This is like other types of monism. However, monism as such generally holds that there's one general type of being. 
you're a materialist, you don't just believe there's only one physical being or substance. You can believe in multiple physical beings and substances. They're just all classified according to one type, physical. But extreme monism posits not only one type of being, but one individual or what philosophers would call one token of a type. So for example, there are theories that God is the only ultimately existing being that could be a form of extreme monism. Or if you regard the entire physical universe as fundamentally one being that doesn't have fundamental distinctions, just internal interconnections and relations, that would be a type of materialist extreme monism. A third main type of ontology is pluralism. And this is uh, a broad category. It just means you believe in three or more fundamental types of being or existence. The first main school of Vedanta is Advaita or non-dual. It was developed by Shankara who lived around 800 CE. Shankara was influenced by the early Upanishads, especially things like the Brihad Aranyaka, which emphasize the unity of Brahman or the Supreme Being and the unity of Brahman with Atman or the soul. Some of the later Upanishads uh, introduce teachings that could be interpreted as dualistic. Shankara's philosophy may have arisen, at least in part, as a response to the philosophical systems developed by Buddhist schools, forms of Mahayana Buddhism, which taught philosophies such as Madhyamaka, the Middle Way, or Yogacara, which focused on consciousness. Shankara's philosophy, though, was rooted in the Vedanta, the Upanishads, and was perhaps an attempt to render a sophisticated Hindu philosophical system rooted in the Veda scriptures. Advaita literally means non-dual, and this is the same meaning as the word monism. It's saying there's only one fundamental reality, which in Advaita is Brahman, or the Supreme Being. Advaita is also extreme monism because it doesn't just posit one general type of reality, such as consciousness, but one specific real being, and that is Brahman. So this is based on teachings from the Upanishads that say that the Atman, the self or the soul, is the same being as Brahman. For example, the sentence taught to Vam Asi, that you are, is often interpreted as identifying you with the Atman or soul and that with Brahman. So you may seem like a distinct being from God or the Supreme Being, but according to this interpretation, you're actually the same being. And in Advaita Vedanta, all of the different sense perceptions and thoughts that we have, that is all of our experience of what appears to be an external or physical reality, things that we can see, hear, touch, taste, and smell, as well as all the individual thoughts or perceptions of our internal reality, things like anger, fear, or other emotions, thoughts and judgments in the mind, etc. All of these are just manifestations of Brahman. So this notion of manifestation is similar to the general Hindu idea that the gods, including the Supreme Being, Brahman, can manifest in samsara, can incarnate into particular forms or bodies. In Advaita Vedanta, all of the perceptions and appearances of samsara are regarded as direct manifestations of Brahman. So Brahman is manifesting all of this, but moreover, Brahman is manifesting this to himself because Brahman is the only absolute being. He's the only consciousness that exists independently. So all of this is a show that Brahman is creating for himself. This is sometimes compared to viewing images in a dream where they don't correspond to a reality outside of your mind or pictures on a screen which depict or represent something um, that is not literally existing off the screen. It's just creating the illusion of a literal existence. So the difference is that on this view, when you're awake, 
and when you're not looking at a screen, it's a similar type of dreamlike imagery. Um, obviously, this is somewhat paradoxical or counterintuitive. We'll get to the paradoxical aspects on the next slide, but it does seem to follow the teachings of the Upanishads very closely. In the Upanishads, there's a great emphasis on the actual unity of all of the reality that we perceive. Shankara gives a metaphor for explaining the basic teaching of Advaita Vedanta. There's a notion throughout Hinduism of Maya, which means illusion. So in Hinduism, there's a common belief that suffering and also being trapped in samsara, dying and being reborn into different bodies only to die again, are the product of illusion, some type of misperception, misunderstanding, or a lack of knowledge of some kind. So salvation is typically thought of in terms of jnana or some kind of transcendent liberating knowledge that ends this illusion. Different sects and schools of Hinduism have different particular conceptions of what the illusion is. In Advaita, the illusion is that anything other than Brahman is real. So if you see your body and you think it's not Brahman, that's Maya or illusion. If you see a mountain and think it's not actually Brahman or the Supreme Being, that is also an illusion. The metaphor Shankara gives is of a person who is looking at a coiled rope and thinks it's a snake, and so they become afraid. This is like someone looking at their perceptions and their thoughts and thinking that it's not Brahman. So this metaphor suggests that the manifestations of Brahman as sights and sounds and thoughts and feelings, for example, the manifestations maybe do have a kind of reality. So in this metaphor, you're looking at something that's actually there. You're looking at a rope. The rope is not an illusion. It's real. What's illusory is interpreting it as a snake. So it's an act of interpretation of your mind that creates the illusion. Now it's possible perhaps to press too heavily on the details of this metaphor, but the nature of the metaphor at least suggests that when we perceive things either externally or internally, they're not all completely illusory. There's something real there, but what's real is just Brahman manifesting as these images. And if we interpret these images as anything other than Brahman or perhaps the activity of Brahman, we're making a mistake and we're creating an illusion for ourselves. Another thing that this metaphor suggests is the danger inherent in illusion because in the metaphor, you're thinking it's a snake and you become afraid. So by analogy, when you look at samsara and think it's not Brahman, you're creating suffering like fear and other bad things for yourself. But on this view, uh, perhaps if viewed correctly, so if we understand Advaita Vedanta, we believe that everything is Brahman, perhaps our appearances, our perceptions will not go away. We'll still see and hear and touch and taste and smell things, for example, but we'll just know all of these things are Brahman. Just like when a person realizes that they're not looking at a snake, their perception of the coiled rope doesn't go away. The only thing that goes away is their illusory perception that they've added on top of it. Despite the fact that this uh, metaphor Shankara gives is very helpful in clarifying what Advaita Vedanta is saying, there are still some paradoxical aspects of the philosophy. Now, this is not unique to Advaita Vedanta. Uh, insofar as it does seem to accurately interpret teachings from the Upanishads, anyone who believes in the Upanishads may be susceptible to these paradoxes. A paradox is a seeming or apparent contradiction. Contradictions are generally thought of as logically impossible. So if you believe in the basic assumptions of most systems of logic, it's impossible for something to both be true and false at the same time. So for example, even Shankara would agree, it's impossible for Brahman to exist and to not exist in the same way at the same time. 
logical contradictions are automatically false. A paradox is something that appears to be a contradiction. Some paradoxes really are contradictions. Others can be resolved through further distinctions or clarification. Now, Advaita Vedanta does try to solve these paradoxes. They try to answer all these problems, but they're the sorts of things that when other people look at this school, they can use these to criticize Advaita. So here are some examples. One is that if there's only one Brahman, there's only one truly existent conscious being, then how is it that our consciousness seems different from that of Brahman? Brahman is conceived of in Hinduism as being perfectly aware. You could think of this as involving complete knowledge or at least the absence of any illusion, whereas our own minds seem prone to error or misperception. So how is it that our mind seems different from Brahman's mind and also seems different from the minds of other people and maybe other animals or other conscious beings. We all have our own thoughts and perceptions that don't seem identical to those of other beings. We seem to be different centers of consciousness. And so this is something that Advaita may have difficulty explaining. Another paradox introduced by this uh, philosophical view is that it seems to conflict with the view of Hinduism and many other religions that the salvation of individual souls can vary. So in other words, one soul can have attained moksha or supreme liberation, union with Brahman, while other souls have not. This seems to be the standard view in Hinduism. And yet there's only one consciousness. How is it possible for that consciousness to both be liberated and not liberated at the same time? Does it have different parts or aspects? Advaita says no, that there are no fundamental divisions within Brahman. And it would seem like you would have to have some type of fundamental division between the state of moksha or liberation and the state of being trapped in samsara. Another paradox is that um, how can maya exist if Brahman is basically completely conscious or aware, free of illusion? In Hinduism, the three main attributes of Brahman are existence, satya, chitta, consciousness, and ananda, which is uh, bliss or absence of suffering. So the second property of chitta or consciousness is generally interpreted as being completely and purely consciousness. If this is a complete consciousness that's devoid of any ignorance or delusion, how is it that Maya exists at all? We're supposed to believe both that Brahman is all conscious and completely aware and free from Maya and also that Maya is real. So one thing about Shankara's coiled snake me uh, metaphor is that the Maya exists in the person's mind when they're misinterpreting the rope as a snake or when they're misinterpreting the world as different from Brahman. How can Brahman both know everything and have Maya at the same time. There's another contradiction too, or seeming contradiction between the property of Brahman of being completely blissful, free of any kind of suffering or lack or insufficiency versus the apparent existence of suffering and evil in Maya, or at least in the world of conditioned reality in samsara. So in samsara, as we typically experience it, there is violence, there is theft, there is uh, ignorance, there is suffering. How could all of this be if Brahman is completely blissful? And Brahman is typically conceived of um, as being completely without you know, sin or evil as well because he's a pure consciousness and he's completely real. He has no insufficiency or lack to him. So all of these things are at least apparent contradictions. So we should also mention the relation between Shankara's philosophy and that of Mahayana Buddhism. The Buddhism series of videos have more detail on the philosophy of Buddhism, but here we can briefly talk about two important schools of Mahayana Buddhism, Madhyamaka and Yogacara. Madhyamaka means the middle way and one of its core teachings is emptiness, which is basically a type of metaphysical theory that says that there's no such thing as an inherent existence. There are things that exist, but their existence is not absolute and they're kind of interconnected with each other. 
So there's nothing that can exist of its own right without depending, at least in part, on something else. One way of interpreting this is the view that there's no what could be called substances in philosophy. A substance is a being that has some kind of existence in its own right. It's not absolutely dependent on other things. Yogacara is a Buddhist school of thought that says that consciousness is the fundamental reality, that everything we seem to perceive is actually uh, something that's happening in consciousness. So physical objects, you could say, are modifications of consciousness. Now, both of these may seem to resemble Advaita. The emptiness teaching may be similar to the Advaita view that our typical perceptions are empty, you might say, of fundamental reality. When we see a table or a rock or a person, we think that they are different from Brahman, that they have a kind of being or substance in their own right. But that's a mistake. They're actually empty of fundamental being. They're just manifestations of Brahman. The difference between this view and Advaita, though, is that Brahman is not empty. Um, Brahman is a substance with real being and reality. And that's something that the Buddhist philosophers would deny. They don't believe in a supreme being like Brahman or in any absolute substance. So there's the other school of Hindu philosophy or Buddhist philosophy, Yogacara, also seems like Advaita insofar as Advaita, by positing that Brahman, the supremely conscious being, is the only reality, is giving a lesser status to physical reality. It seems to be teaching a kind of idealism, a consciousness only, or that consciousness is more real than physical reality. So th once again, the difference between Advaita Vedanta and Yogacara is that Yogacara does not posit an absolute being or substance like Brahman. Yogacara seems to posit multiple independent conscious uh, beings. So these would be sentient beings in the metaphysics of Buddhism. Um, but that's different from Brahman because Brahman is the only uh, inherent being or substance in Advaita Vedanta. So there's an, a sense of multiplicity of consciousnesses in Yogacara. Whereas in Advaita, Brahman is the one fundamentally real conscious being. Vishisht Advaita Vedanta is the second main school of Vedanta. This was developed by Ramanuja, who lived from 1017 to 1137 CE. He was a Tamil speaker from South India. This is significant because by the medieval era, uh, South India, which uh, included many kingdoms in which the people spoke Dravidian languages not derived from Sanskrit, such as Tamil and Kannada, uh, became a real center of Hinduism. Hinduism had spread there in ancient times from the north, and by the medieval period, some of the greatest saints and scholars and temples uh, in, that were Hindu could be found in South India. Ramanuja lived under the Chola Empire, which was a Tamil uh, ethnic dynasty of kings in what is now the state of Tamil Nadu and some other places in South India. Ramanuja thought that Shankara had gone too far in one direction. Uh, specifically, he neglected the Bhakti tradition. Shankara probably would have seen this as a feature, not a bug. Shankara's philosophy is really rooted in the Upanishads and he doesn't make that many concessions to the later bhakti tradition of devotional Hinduism, which focuses on a god or goddess that you worship as a divine being and as your kind of like savior who will give you the path to moksha. Ramanuja, though, was an alvar, so he was a devotee of the god Vishnu. The alvars were a sect of... Uh, Vishnu worshippers, uh, basically they were founded by these saints, people who had attained moksha through following the god Vishnu. And they were from the Tamil speaking part of South India. They're still very important in Hinduism today. So Ramanuja, his goal was essentially to reconcile the more monistic teachings of the Vedanta with the more dualistic teachings of bhakti. The basic logic or concept of bhakti or devotion is that there seems to be a kind of separation between the human soul and God. 
So the human soul is trapped in samsara, is prone to maya and suffering. And in order to attain moksha or salvation, you basically have to love, be committed to, and participate in the life of God or the goddess you worship. And then uh, they will help save you. Um, basically, your selfless love, together with their action, can make you attain moksha and liberate you from samsara and suffering. So in order to try to reconcile these, Ramanuja proposed a school known as Vishisht Advaita, which means qualified non-dual. So he does agree with Shankara that Brahman is the only inherently existing being. So there's only one true being or substance, and it is Brahman. However, unlike Shankara, Ramanuja says Brahman does have multiplicity. There's a real difference between different aspects of Brahman. You could say that souls and matter are different aspects, or perhaps you could, pair, could compare them to different parts of Brahman. So just as an individual person, for example, has hands and feet, and their hands and feet have different properties. The feet are things that you can walk on, the hands you can use to grasp object, you have an imposable thumb in your hand, but not in your foot, etc. They have their own real distinct properties. However, they don't have an absolute existence on their own. Your hand or your foot couldn't exist and couldn't function in the same way outside of the whole person or the whole body. So similarly, um, for Ramanuja, souls and matter don't exist outside of Brahman. They are aspects of Brahman, but they do have a real difference between them. So you can make objective distinctions between individual souls and between souls and matter and between all of those and God or Brahman. So let's look at Ramanuja's metaphysics or his theory of reality uh, a little more in detail. We can use a distinction from Western philosophy between a substance and its attributes to illustrate his concepts. Now, this distinction is not unique to Western philosophy, but different philosophical traditions can have different ways of kind of spelling it out. A substance is a being that can exist on its own in some sense. It does not depend what you might call essentially or fundamentally on anything else for its existence. Now, this phrase depend essentially could be somewhat ambiguous. There's different types of dependence on things. Uh, and really, substances can probably be defined differently by different theorists. Some of them may talk about different types of dependence here. But when we distinguish between substance and attributes, when we say the attributes do depend essentially on a substance for their existence, we're talking about a very fundamental type of dependence in that you cannot even conceive of an attribute apart from its substance. So for example, if a rock has the attribute of being a rusty or reddish color, the rock would be the substance and the color would be the attribute. The attribute you could say is in the rock. The red is in the rock. The attribute is in the substance in some sense. But the redness cannot be pulled apart from the rock. It cannot exist on its own as a separate substance. However, the rock can change in at least some of its properties. Typically, there's also a distinction between essential attributes and non-essential or accidental attributes. So the essential ones are the ones the substance needs to keep in order to maintain its being, whereas the accidental ones are the ones that can change and the rock could still, or the substance could still keep its being. So for example, the, uh, the particular weight of a rock might be an accidental property. If it loses some of its uh, particles, some of its uh, atoms or molecules, it could still exist as a substance, even though its attribute of weight or mass has changed. However, other of its um, properties or attributes might be essential. So if you heat it, beyond a certain amount, it might lose all of its uh, chemical structure and cease to be that kind of substance. Now, there might be problems with the way I explain that individual rock example, but it illustrates the general ideas. With both essential and accidental attributes, though, 
they really depend on substances for their existence. You can't conceive of them existing kind of floating free like ghosts in the world. Like the color, for example, of the rock uh, or the weight of the rock don't exist outside of the rock itself. And so Ramanuja would say that souls and matter are attributes of Brahman. They really depend fundamentally on Brahman for their existence. You can't even conceive of souls or matter as existing outside of Brahman, but they do have a real distinction between them. Just like you can distinguish between different attributes of the rock. You can distinguish between its color and its mass. Those are not the same things, but they cannot exist outside of the rock. Souls and matter are not the same things. Individual souls have real differences, but they still inhere in God. However, there's still a paradox here because God is typically described, God or Brahman is described as having three main attributes in Hinduism, as mentioned previously, Satya, Chitta, Ananda, being, consciousness, and bliss. These seem different from the attributes of individual souls and matter. There's also another layer of um, theory going on here, which is that we're using the term attribute somewhat ambiguously. Souls and matter may be attributes of God, but they also have individual attributes of their own. For example, one soul might be happy, another might be angry at the same time. One material object may have a mass of one gram, another material object may have a mass of one kilogram, etc. So there's really at least two layers of attributes going on with um, Brahman. However, the other uh, paradox is that the attributes, souls and matter, or even their particular attributes of mass, emotions, whatever, all of those seem different from the transcendental attributes of God, you might say, the big three, being, consciousness, and bliss. How is this possible? Ramanuja makes a distinction between two types of attributes of Brahman. The primary attributes are the ones that apply to Brahman as a whole, you might say. You could use the word God to describe the the holistic or fundamental, the complete aspect of Brahman. And that's the one that has the attributes of being, consciousness, and bliss. Whereas souls and matter are not the whole. They're the particular attributes of Brahman. So similarly, perhaps to an example uh, of the hand and foot as parts of the body, um, you, we could say that the whole body has certain traits like a mass but that's different from the individual mass of just the hand or just the foot. That's just an analogy and it may not exactly characterize what Ramanuja is saying, but it's pretty close, at least it illustrates his general idea. So he's basically distinguishing between different parts or layers of reality in Brahman to try to reconcile the paradox of the all-knowing, all-conscious nature of God versus the limited uh, knowledge of individual souls, for example. There's a Hindu term called tattva, which means an aspect of reality. And this term does not originate with Ramanuja. It goes back to Sankhya, the earliest school of Hindu philosophy, uh, more than a thousand years before Ramanuja. Uh, but it's helpful to illustrate Ramanuja's view, his metaphysics. Tattva is an aspect of reality, and different Hindu schools have different theories of how many tattvas there are and what they are. Ramanuja believes in three main uh, or principal tattvas. God, uh, which is often called Ishvara by Ramanuja, a similar term is used in yoga philosophy in Hinduism, souls and matter. The view of the three tattvas uh, has origins in the later Upanishads, and it was probably shared by many ancient Hindus. So God is one aspect of reality and the others are souls and matter. So there's at least three main types of being going on here. Uh, even though there's a kind of tripartite nature to this metaphysics, because we have three tattvas, God, souls, and matter, it's often referred to as dualism in Hinduism, because the most important distinction or duality is between God and everything else, between God and the creation, especially between God and individual souls. The monistic Advaita teaching really emphasizes the union between the individual soul and Brahman, whereas the more dualistic teachings emphasize the distinctiveness of the individual soul and Brahman or God, that you are not God in your fundamental nature, 
you're just a creation of God. And so that's going to affect the path to your salvation on a lot of these uh, views. The third main school of Vedanta is Dvaita, which just means dualism. It was developed by Madhva, who lived from 1199 to 1278. He was from another part of South India, what's now Karnataka. He criticized both Shankara and Ramanuja. Shankara in particular, he claimed of being a hidden Buddhist, someone who claimed to be Hindu, but was just um, basically trying to put Buddhist teachings in a Hindu disguise. Uh, this was discussed previously. We did make some distinctions between Shankara and actual Buddhist philosophy, but that was the response that Madhva and some other Hindus had to Shankara. Madhva was uh, eager to reconcile Vedanta more fully with bhakti or devotional Hinduism. So he really leans on the dualistic aspects of Vedanta. The dualism, at least within the uh, context of Vedanta, is the teaching that Brahman is a distinct being from souls and matter. Souls and matter are substances. They are, in some respect, existing on their own. They can be separated from Brahman. They're not part of the same being or substance. So let's look at Madhva's metaphysics in a bit more detail. Atman is the individual soul and Brahman is God. Atman and Brahman are both eternal. However, the distinction is that Brahman does not depend on Atman for his existence. Versus Atman does depend on Brahman for its existence. And you'll notice the diagram here differs from that of Ramanuja. In the diagram I created for Ramanuja, the souls and matter were inside the circle of God or Brahman. So there are different aspects or parts, you might say, of the same being. In this diagram, Atman and matter are in circles outside of God. So they're distinct beings. However, they still depend on God or Brahman for their existence. What's the distinction between this and Vishishta Advaita Vedanta? In Vishishta Advaita Vedanta, the dependence is more fundamental. It's similar to that between a substance and its attributes. Like you can't even conceive of the attribute red existing outside of the substance rock. In uh, Dvaita Vedanta, the dualistic Vedanta of Madhva, the Atman, the soul, and the matters, they can exist outside of God. They're separate beings. They depend for their existence on God and that God is the creator of them. This is a causal dependence, their effects things that are produced by the activity of God. So um, the theory of salvation of Madhva is also distinct from that of Shankara or Ramanuja. Madhva basically says, in addition to practicing what the Upanishads advocate, renunciation, meditation, living very simply, giving up all your worldly possessions, etc., you also need bhakti, which is faith or devotion. So he's even more influenced by Bhakti Hinduism than by the Upanishads, than the other um, Vedanta theorists were. So Bhakti is a necessary condition or a necessary part of the path to moksha or spiritual liberation on this view.